Hello, welcome to our special online event, the International Women's Day Conference 2021, organized by the National University Health System, Women in Science and Healthcare Organization, known as WISH, with support from the National University of Singapore, Yonglu Lin School of Medicine, Office for Equal Opportunities and Career Development, known as EOCD. My name is Swain Chen, and with me is Melina Sapaya. We're both members of the NUHS WISH Executive Council, and we'll be your hosts for today's webinar. Today's program is in conjunction with International Women's Day, which is celebrated on March 8th every year. The theme for this year's International Women's Day is Choose to Challenge. I'd like to share with our esteemed audience a quote attributed to Mother Teresa. Alone, I cannot change the world, but I can cast a stone across the waters to create many ripples. Together, let's create many ripples. We have an exciting lineup of speakers to talk about research and academia in healthcare, focusing particularly on leadership and gender equi equity. In keeping with the theme of Choose to Challenge, we also have a special segment that will highlight the work of recent equal opportunities and career development EOCD grant recipients in their efforts to identify, quantify, and rectify system systemic problems in relation to opportunity and career development. Importantly, we would like today's webinar to be as interactive as possible. Please feel free to post your comments and questions at any time. Before we get started, a few quick housekeeping notes. This webinar will be recorded and all, all participants will receive a link to the video afterwards. We will have a question and answer session later in the webinar, so we encourage you to submit questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. We'll also have a brief break about halfway through so you can stretch your legs or refill on water. Thank you all again for joining us today. So let's get started. I'd first like to introduce Associate Professor Sophia Archuleta, Head of the Division of Infectious Diseases at the National University Hospital in Singapore. She is a founder and the current president of WISH and will kick off today's event. Professor Archuleta, over to you. Good morning and welcome to the inaugural NUHS Women in Science and Healthcare International Women's Day Conference. I'm truly excited this day is finally here. It's been in the making for quite a while and even though our plans last year were derailed by everyone's viral nemesis, COVID-19 just couldn't stop us this year. As WISH president, it's been my absolute pleasure to work with a dynamic WISH executive council and partner with the NUS Medicine Office of Equal Opportunities and Career Development in bringing this event to our NUHS community. We felt it was important for us to start coming together to commemorate International Women's Day and celebrate each year's theme in ways that befit our academic health setting, as well as to participate in the conversation taking place nationally and internationally to empower women in the workforce and in leadership. In years to come, where the conference format can safely revert back to a physical meeting, we look forward to the conference being more interactive and a place for all to network, celebrate achievements and exchange ideas for a more equitable future. I wanna take a look at today's uh, program. So here's a little bit, uh, a taste of what we have in store uh, for you this morning. We'll have some opening remarks in the first half by our chief executive, our guest of honor, Madam Rahayu Mazam, and then our Dean, Prof Chong. We will also be joined by one of our plenary speakers, Prof Catherine Maitland, to talk to us about navigating a career in global health. We'll have a short break um, after this point so everyone can stretch your legs and uh, bear with me one moment. And then after the break, uh, we'll switch gears and hear from Mrs. Sarah Huggett about researchers' uh, journey through a gender lens. And then we'll be joined uh, by my good friend, um, Associate Professor Gunn and the two inaugural grant, uh, EOCD grant call recipients before we end with uh, what we hope will be a very stimulating uh, and rewarding uh, panel, as well as Q&A session for you all to ask your questions. So that leaves me to thank you all for joining us today and choosing to celebrate International Women's Day with us uh, this year and hope in years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Archuleta, for your vision in starting WISH 
and your efforts to raise awareness and make systemic improvements for gender equity at NUHS and in Singapore overall, including this event. We'd next like to invite the Chief Executive of the National University Health System, Professor Yeo Keguan, who also holds positions as the Irene Tan Liang King Professor in Medicine and Oncology and the Senior Vice President for Health Affairs at the National University of Singapore. Support from the highest levels of management is crucial for making the types of systemic changes that are needed to address the core issues underlying gender disparities in healthcare and across the nation. And we are very fortunate in Singapore and in the NUHS and NUS to have strong support from our leadership, as you'll hear in the next several talks. At NUHS, more than 80% of the workforce is comprised of women. With such a large proportion of female employees, NUHS has made a conscious effort in providing flexible working arrangements, childcare leave, and on-site childcare facilities made available to both men and women, to name just a few examples of changes driven by our leadership. We look forward to extending this progress into the future. Professor Keguan, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Melina and Swain. Uh, good morning, everyone. Our guest of honor, Madam Rahayu Razam, Mazam, Parliamentary Secretary of the Ministry of, for Health and Member of Parliament for the Jurong GRC, friends and colleagues. I'm delighted to welcome all of you to the first International Women's Day Conference organized by the NUHS WISH Women in Science and Healthcare. It's an opportune time to launch the inaugural edition of what I'm sure will be a regular and well-attended event. Minister Masagos Zulkifli has declared 2021 as the year of celebrating Singapore women, their progress and potential. So I want to take this opportunity to celebrate with all our female colleagues. We wouldn't be here where we are if not for you. We are fortunate to have many role models in our community and uh, we should take the opportunity to, to appreciate and celebrate them. Earlier this year, I was fortunate to have participated in a ceremony at the National University of Singapore, which celebrated the lifetime achievements of Dr. Un Chu Singh, conferring upon her the prestigious honorary degree of Doctor of Letters. Dr. Un is one of Singapore's first obstetrics and gynecology practitioners, uh, but she had a remarkable career. In the 1930s, she started training as a young nurse. And then the second phase of her career was uh, she went on to do medical training uh, during the Second World War and went on to become the first obstetrician and gynecologist in Singapore. In an era where women were defined by the roles at that time of wives and mothers, Dr. Un stood tall in her own right as an assertive, straight-talking, trailblazing medical professional. And after retiring from a full-time practice in 1991 at the age of 75, she continued to dedicate herself to public service and philanthropy, setting up Singapore's first dementia home in 1999 and contributing to research in women's health, anti-aging science and dementia at the National University. So Dr. Un is an inspiring role model for our young men and women in science and healthcare and a reminder to never let social norms or stereotypes limit oneself and one's potential. We've come so far since Dr. Un's time. For the past five academic years at the National University of Singapore, Yong Lulin School of Medicine, female students made up half or up to 55% of the medical class enrollment. At NUHS, our group chiefs of finance, HR, IT, communications and procurement are all female. So we mentioned that 80% of our world workforce is female. That being said, there is gender disparity at the CEO and clinical heads level. One of the ways we seek to improve this is by ensuring fair representation of female clinicians and professionals in our candidate pool for department leaderships and making the final selection based on merit, regardless of gender. It's my fervent hope to see more women represented at all levels of leadership, not only in NUHS, but across our society, in science, in politics, business, and other realms. We welcome more conversation and ideas on how we can create a more equitable future for women everywhere. Before I end, I'd like to thank and to welcome our guest of honor, Parliamentary Secretary of the Ministry for Health and Member of Parliament for Jurong GRC, Madam Rahayu Mazam, as well as our three speakers, Professor Chong Yap Singh, Professor Catherine Maitland, and Mrs. Sarah Hugat. 
We are all looking forward to hearing your perspective and insights. I wish all of you a very successful event and I hope everyone enjoys the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Si, for sharing this inspiring story of Dr. Un and for your support, both personally and public, as well as institutionally in your leadership role for the mission and goals of WISH, EOCD, and the spirit of International Women's Day. This gives us great hope in leading the changes to make equity a reality at NUHS. Now, we are very honored to have with us our guest of honor, Madam Rahayu Mazam. Madam Rahayu is the Parliamentary Secretary for Health and a member of Parliament for Jurong GRC. She has been volunteering from the age of 17 and is very community centric. In a pilot at Bukit Batok East, where she is the chairperson, she worked tirelessly with agencies to help disadvantaged women find jobs. Moreover, Madam Rahayu is a co-leading comprehensive uh, co-leading a uh, comprehensive parliamentary review of issues affecting women in Singapore. She also advocates for more support for persons with disability and for families of children with special needs. I'd like to add a special note of thanks to you, Madam Rahayu, for the many conversations you have initiated around the uneven distribution of parenting and caregiving loads that women often take on. As a mother, wife, and caregiver working full-time, I would like to express my appreciation to you for your ongoing efforts. Madam Rahayu, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Malena. Good morning, everyone. My heartfelt greetings to all present this morning, and my special thanks to the National University Health System, NHS, for your effort in bringing us together to celebrate the achievements of women who have advanced in their careers in science and healthcare. It is especially meaningful that this event is held in celebration of International Women's Day on 8th March this week. Many Singaporean women, including those in healthcare, have made tremendous progress and contributions over the years. In view of this, the Ministry of Social and Family Development has dedicated 2021 as the year of celebrating SG women. So while COVID-19 has cast a shadow over many women who struggle to overcome their challenging situations, it has also provided opportunities for them to show strength in being the everyday heroes in our community. Many of you who work in the healthcare sector are women. Over the years, you have worked hard to give us the highest quality of care. During COVID-19 pandemic, you've once again stepped up and made sacrifices working in high-risk environments while balancing your other roles as mothers, wives, and daughters. You have been working hard before the pandemic, but showed true commitment in Singapore's fight against the virus. We have a lot to be proud of, having our women at the forefront of this battle against the pandemic. From a broader perspective, beyond the healthcare sector, we want to deepen and grow the partnership between our women and men as we work together hand in hand to create um, and catalyze solutions that will shift societal mindsets to foster an even more equitable and inclusive Singapore. It is also my privilege to be involved in the task force that is leading the conversations on Singapore women's development to further progress the lives of Singapore women since 20, September 2020. We will carefully study the feedback received to identify and forge consensus on areas we can work together on. The review will culminate in a white paper in the second half of this year. An issue raised at the conversations is the shared desire to see an increased representation of women in corporate leadership positions. Many women and men have shared feedback on how women can be supported in the workplace and in their career aspirations, such as promoting positive work-life practices to enable all workers, including women, to better balance their personal and family commitments with career pursuits, having more women in corporate leadership positions and putting in place formal and informal mentorship and networking platforms for women leaders to support and learn from each other. We recognize and value the importance of having more women leaders on boards and in senior management positions across sectors as women add to the diversity in skill sets, experiences and perspectives in organizations. While women are highly valued, more can be done to collectively empower, protect and uplift women. This can't be done overnight, especially as mindset shifts in our society will take time. But I am confident we can collectively create a better and more inclusive Singapore. 
Finally, to all healthcare workers and fellow women here with us today, I would like to thank each of you for your amazing work and dedication to the profession and for keeping all of us safe. Thank you very much and have a good session today. Thank you, Madam Rahayu, for these insightful comments that also give us a broader perspective on the entire Singaporean ecosystem into which NUHS, academia, and the healthcare industry fits. Just as we're trying to drive the awareness that change needs to come at the institutional as well as individual level, a larger recognition at the government level, backed up by support through policy, is also needed to ultimately change society and the various industries that make up. Among the WISH members and the leadership of NUHS and NUS, along with many others in the country, we were very excited to hear the recent news of the government's ongoing review of women's issues in Singapore and about the upcoming white paper to advise future policy. And we're very honored that you could join us today, Madam Rahayu. I'd also like to say a special welcome to members of the media that have joined us today for the IWD Conference 2021. We'd now like to turn the floor over to the Dean of the Yong Lulin School of Medicine at NUS and the Lien Ying Chao Professor of Medicine, Professor Chong Yap Singh. He has been another stalwart champion and supporter of WISH and its mission within NUHS, a faithful participant in our events and a fount of new and original ideas and initiatives to drive awareness and change. Professor Chong, over to you, please. Thank you, Melina. Let me uh, share my screen. A very good morning to Madam Rahayu Mazam, Parliamentary Secretary, Ministry of Health and Parli Member of Parliament Durong GRC, Professor Yo Ke Guan, Chief Executive of the National University Health System, Professor Katrin Maitland, Director of the Institute for Global Health Innovation Center for African Research and Engagement, Imperial College London, Mrs. Sarah Haggard, Asia Pacific Business Development Director of Open Science Solutions, Elsevier, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. COVID-19 has changed all our lives. We didn't expect it would do so in the early months of 2020 when it first arrived in Singapore, but it has. And it has done so in a way that life will never be the same again in many aspects. However, one area where it is probably going to have a major positive effect, at least in Singapore, is in a way society views the roles and rights of women. With the war against COVID-19, women have fought side by side with men at the front lines, in intensive care units, isolation wards, quarantine facilities, schools, homes, and hearts. On 30th of January this year, the Singapore government made the first step in announcing that 2021 will be the year of celebrating SG women. This is a small but very much needed step to actively promote gender equality throughout all strata of society. I can feel it. This is going to be a huge year for women in Singapore. The government is engaging the general populace about gender issues and talking about possible changes in policy. More important than policy is the narrative that we craft collectively as a nation, that we should respect, protect, and cherish women for what they are, the bearers of our future, the linchpin that holds families together, and for the unique talents that each woman adds to our community. In my International Women's Day message sent out on Monday, I wrote that with COVID-19 bringing about a great opportunity for reset. We need to take advantage of this and act decisively to make sure that women are supported and empowered for a gender equitable future. The NUS Medicine Office of Equal Opportunities and Career Development is one such initiative that is helmed by Professors Gan Yun Wen and Sophia Achadata. Since 2019, they have done an extraordinary amount of work to initiate in-depth discussions around important issues of gender equality and equal opportunities for all. They have pushed for corrective actions in NUS medicine, including drafting new policies and introducing workshops, as well as organizing today's International Women's Day virtual symposium. In January this year, we released an NUS medicine gender equality policy to reaffirm our stance to uphold gender equality in the school. 
The team has initiated workshops for the leaders of NUS Medicine on cognitive bias, which will be progressively introduced to the rest of the school in the coming months. They've also launched research grants to promote actionable research in gender equality. We still have a long way to go in creating a gender equitable environment, but we have taken the first steps. As a school, we need to consciously make deliberate efforts to represent women's viewpoints in all our decision-making to counter the existing unconscious biases that is prevalent in our communities and societies. In February this year, the Straits Times reported that women pursuing STEM degrees in local universities have increased to 41% in 2019 from 38% two years before. Yet, despite more women holding STEM degrees, the 2018 A-Star Manpower Survey reported that only 30% of local researchers and engineers are women. The reasons given for this leaky pipeline were mainly women choosing to prioritize family obligations, the family unfriendly work environments in the industry, professional and social marginalization, and gaps in research funding. These reasons are not unique to STEM or Singapore, but they are persistent problems that, that countless women have had to face. But there is hope to turn the situation around, especially if the interests that Singapore's government and people are taking in these matters. As a school and community, it's imperative that we support the women in our midst so that they can make seamless transitions between work and home and manage professional and personal commitments without having to make big compromises. The absence of women in senior leadership positions means that we are losing exceptional talent whose abilities and different viewpoints can advance medicine and public health much further than we have managed so far. To prevent this, we must keep making a deliberate choice and conscious effort to challenge situations where women are not considered or represented. To achieve this, men should come on board and champion this cause by being considerate, supportive, and exercise deliberate, inclusive, collaborative decision-making. After all, the government makes it almost seamless for men to fulfill their national service and reservist obligations. Having children and raising families is also national service and shouldn't be reasons for restricting the career choices, pay or progress of women. Now for some advice. First of all, I wouldn't dare to presume to give any advice to women. Uh, but Tuesday morning, I attended an International Women's Day webinar organized by the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, which featured former US Secretary of State Madeleine Albright uh, who is more than qualified to advise women. This was her advice, and I quote, you have to work hard and know what you're doing. There's plenty of room in the world for mediocre men. There is no room for mediocre women. You have to enter a meeting determined to say something, to make an impact. You have to time it carefully, but you have to say something. She went on to recall a rather chaotic class that she ran for women in Harvard, where she said, you don't raise your hands to speak, you have to interrupt. My mantra is to interrupt. If you raise your hands, you have to wait your turn. There are so many times when you're in a meeting and you want to say something, but you think to yourself, no, I will sound silly. Then a man says exactly what you're going to say and everybody thinks it's great. Don't let that happen to you. Finally, you have to be good at what you do, but it helps to have men championing you and helping you in your career. The theme for this year's International Women's Day is choose to challenge. I urge all men everywhere to challenge the status quo. Choose to question why there are no women in your committee. Choose to speak up and support women for new positions that come up. Choose to challenge today. Today's International Women's Day conference is focused on institutional and national efforts to improve workplace inclusivity and equality. In the coming months, the Yongludin School of Medicine will strive to walk the talk by upholding a commitment of empowering women and minority groups through policy adjustments. We will continue to facilitate more conversations on equal opportunities through workshops and conferences so that our community will proactively choose to support the women in our midst, not just by talking, but through action. Lastly, I wish all attendees a very empowering International Women's Day conference. Thank you.
Thank you for all your support and encouragement for WISH and EOCD at NUS Dean Chong Yap Singh. And in particular for driving the recognition of the persistent bias and the need for mindset change regarding the traditional roles that women have held in healthcare and society at large. Um, special thanks for mentioning Madeleine Albright. We could probably add Ruth Bader Ginsburg in that pool of um, champions and giants. I'd like to introduce our next speaker. I first met Professor Catherine Maitland two weeks ago when we were preparing the video recording of a talk as she is currently working in South Africa. With the time difference, it would be an unearthly hour for her to make an appearance now, but she will join us at around 11 a.m. Singapore time for the panel discussion and will be delighted to meet you and answer her audience's questions. Professor Catherine, Catherine Maitland is a professor of pediatric tropical infectious diseases and director of eye care center at the Institute for Global Health Innovation at Imperial College in London. Although she started her career in South India and Vanuatu, that's in the Southwest Pacific, for the last 20 years, she has been based full time in Africa, Kenya, Uganda, Malawi, performing clinical research to improve the care for childhood infectious diseases, the leading cause of mortality in resource limited sub Saharan Africa. She loves the informality of pediatric wards, caring for the young and most vulnerable. This is what John Myberg, Professor of Critical Care Medicine, has to say of Professor Maitland. Her work, particularly in the field of fluid resuscitation, blood transfusion medicine, and oxygen therapy has provided new insights into the effectiveness and efficacy of the fundamental in interventions. We're honored to have Professor Maitland share her story of her career in clinical research in this unique environment. Due to time zone considerations, Professor Maitland has recorded her talk but she will be joining us in person for the Q&A session later in the webinar. So please remember to post your questions using the Q&A function. And now for Professor Maitland's talk, Navigating a Career in Global Health. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure and an absolute honor to be attending your very important conference for uh, women in science. Um, I'm employed by Imperial College London, but I've spent the last 20 years um, based on the coast of Kenya in, uh, in Africa. And I just want to tell you how I got there. Um, so that's the first part of my talk about navigating a career in global health. I'm one of those people who, from a childhood, I always wanted to be a doctor. Um, my mum was trying to sort of temper my uh, expectations, um, so, you know, so trying to think that, you know, I, I might not make it because it, it's tough getting into medicine, um, as you all know. But um, I was very fortunate um, and uh, uh, got a place at St. Bartholomew's Medical School all those um, years ago. In fact, that, that was the year that I qualified, 1986. Um, and... Uh, I, I was drawn to paediatrics. Um, I like the informality of the paediatric ward. There's a lot of infectious diseases that uh, at the time when we, we were there. And um, when children get better, they really get better. And often they're seen screening around the wards um, at top speed. So I, I just really enjoyed that. And so that's why I decided to specialize in paediatrics. Now, obviously doing your specialization, you need to take some exams. Um, and I was based, this is the sister hospital to Great Ormond Street Hospital, um, if, if believe it or not, it's uh, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Hackney. It serves a very, very poor and very diverse community. And I actually saw lots and lots of, um, I had a huge experience there, but I did need to get my specialist exams. And so I went on a, a course um, for the MRCP um, uh, speciality, um, and that was in, in 1990. And this is my, one of my first lessons I want to uh, uh, share with you, follow your heart. It was on that course that I met this gentleman. Uh, he's now Professor Tom Williams. He specializes in uh, um, all these years later in uh, looking at the role of uh, uh, hemoglobin offices in the protection of um, meds, in protect, protection of malaria. But I met this person 
and I already knew that this what was going to happen and three months later we were engaged to get married but the, the thing that really drew us together was the the fact that we both wanted to work overseas we wanted to do what was called at the time tropical medicine it's now called global health um, and we set about applying for jobs um, and we were put up and one of these units was the um, was funded by the Medical Research Council in the UK in, in the Gambia, uh, did a, was doing a lot of research, particularly in malaria. And we both applied for a position there. Um, and this is what the, um, I got back from the then director of uh, uh, the research. So obviously that was a huge crushing blow. There's nothing in your CV that recommends you to the career in research. Well, I'm here <laughs> all these years later and uh, so yeah don't don't ever get put off by results but obviously you need one does need a first lucky break and our lucky break came when we put in a joint application for a job advert that we'd seen um, in the Lancet and um, uh, it was Professor Sir David Weatherall who was asking people to go to the New Hebrides um, as it was called at the time, um, to uh, look at whether alpha thalassemia, which is a clinically silent anemia in the population, it, it's present in nearly 50% of them, whether that actually protects against malaria. Well, I'd only ever heard of the Hebrides, which was a northern part of uh, islands outside of the UK, and I thought that was most odd. Um, and at the time, there was no internet. Um, and we didn't have any any uh, any um, uh, atlases on us, and so we went to the um, actual uh, interview in a bit of a panic because a alpha thalassemia at the clinically silent we didn't really concentrate on during our medical school, and then b we didn't know where the new Hebrides were, but in fact they are you probably know them a spirit uh, well a Vanuatu it's a archipelago of uh, um, eighty islands, and we were going to be based in Espiritu Santo, um, and as I've already given you the background, lots of people have alpha thalassemia, which is, I keep on saying, clinically silent, and the, the question was whether that was due to the fact that uh, they've, got, they've got this and it protected them against malaria. So that was in 1991. Um, we went to this island and we did a community-based study. We redesigned the actual studies that were being there, so we were able to do community follow-up. Um, and it was uh, even being recognised as a doctor, I struggled there. They all, all of the population called me Mrs. Brong, Dr. Tom, my husband, um, which is me. Uh, that's the, they basically had his wife rather than the doctor by myself, which I thought was quite funny. But one of the other surprising things is just before we were about to go, um, uh, Jonathan Clegg, who's a, a, a specialist in the alpha thalassemia, uh, David Weatherall's right hand man, said, do you know I'm going to go to Vanuatu to have babies? And I was shocked. It was my first research project. Of course I'm not. 1992, that's our best mistake ever. Within a few months, I was pregnant when I got there. And uh, that's our first boy, little Lawrence. And it happened again. It was only a three-year project, and this little boy was Joshua was born in Melbourne. So, um, but we did. Uh, we we're able to bring our family along with us because it was a community-based project, and uh, I think it positively benefited it. So again, the flexibility that you have to bring in to any project. So off we go back, and we've got a whole pile of data we now need to analyse it. And I was going to look at the epidemiology of malaria there. And I put in a welcome trust application, and this is my another big blow. Um, we did not realise that the welcome trust was now giving fellowships to wives. I could not believe that. It's 1995, and somebody else had also written that I don't believe Dr. Mason has written any of this fellowship. Well, I suppose that they could think, well, she's had two babies since she's been there, so why wouldn't we believe that she'd been involved in the project at all? But I did get that uh, fun of uh, the fellowship. I think I, I had robust responses and we started to, for the first time, to describe things that haven't been described about uh, the relationship of alpha of, of, of bivax and falciparum uh, malaria, where the bivax was acting as a almost like a vaccine against the severe effects of the falciparum um, disease. We also 
um, we, we didn't see any severe malaria. There should be severe malaria, but we didn't see any, we reported that. But also let the data tell the story. We were sent out to show that alpha thalassemia protects against malaria. But in fact, we showed the opposite. We showed that actually children in earlier life tend to get more infection, but particularly virus. And this is again, this we were suggesting whether there was some evidence of cross species immunity. So we had been very productive, and uh, I think that yes, they, the gamble had actually played off, and we got lots of uh, sort of outputs for and, for and from my fellowship. But obviously, not in proper forgetting the other outputs. Um, and uh, yes, our family was complete. Um, so I was still getting comments about, oh, it's so good that you're helping Tom with his research. And these were from professors in, in Oxford, and et cetera. So I thought, well, if we're gonna go, and we plan to go to Africa, if we're gonna go there, we do need to put some clear water between ourselves. Although we had no problems between ourselves, it was me getting some recognition for the work that I'd been doing. So in, um, we went off to Kilifi in, in Kenya. And this, as I said, it's based on the coast. We, we, this, this is where we live and this is a lovely research unit that's there. It's, 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 and that's where we've been, in fact, for the last 20 years. I need to update that slide. Um, we went there because we wanted to study severe malaria. Um, particularly, I wanted to study severe malaria. There was still a huge hotspot for malaria. 90% of the world's deaths um, occur in Africa, in, mainly in children under five, um, from falsehood from malaria. Um, my project was about what do we do to, oh, how can we help these children? Because many will die um, within hours of coming into hospital, meaning what happens in the emergency rooms, those initial decisions in anybody's life when they go into a, an emergency room, that sort of transcends around the world. These are really important. What treatments can we apply um, to the, the, the illness of severe malaria in the emergency room that might save lives. Um, I just want to be mindful that um, most, of the, uh, apart from private hospitals, that there are no intensive care units. So basically that's as good as you get as your emergency room. Um, so that's, that, that's where we, we start. I'd been at St. Mary's Hospital. They, had, they were renowned for their work with meningococcal disease. And we wondered whether actually using good clinical acumen and uh, appropriate um, therapies, whether we could save lives in Africa. And these are the types of treatments that you might reach for in the emergency room. So when I arrived in Kenya um, and looking at all the guidelines, these are the type of things that uh, you would receive as potentially life-saving um, interventions in the emergency room. And at the time, there was recommendations in the guideline, but none had been based on any clinical trials. And uh, I was hoping to try and rectify that. First of all, I needed to understand what severe malaria was that at the, at the time, largely for epidemiological purposes and research uh, studies in genetics, they'd rationalized the syndrome of uh, malaria into either cerebral malaria, that of an unconscious fitting child, or that of the complication of, of severe anemia. But in reality, there was a huge overlap. And it also, these didn't really good, give a good handle about how, how am I gonna treat that critically sick child in the emergency room? So the first, thing that I try to do is try and use the sort of sepsis um, type of approach to try and deconstruct the severe malaria clinical phenotype. So um, in the emergency room, we talk about the ABC um, and uh, it's, and so when I try to look at these, this is an observational study, trying to look at these, how common were they in, in children? Um, obviously, if, you're, if you've got a low oxygen saturation, you need oxygen, and that wasn't really in the guideline for ch children with malaria. Um, if you've got um, evidence of shock, which a lot of children had, again, there was not very strong uh, recommendations around that. So we're now beginning to see a, a, ch a child with severe malaria that looks more like sepsis. I also went on to, particularly for this shock phenotype, I tried to look at what would happen um, if we gave them fluid resuscitation, which is the standard treatment. Um, and we, uh, we used a line called a central venous pressure line um, and titrated how much fluid that we gave them. We found it was very low to start with. In other words, very strong evidence for shock. And we gave children um, a dose of or what we call a bolus between 20 and 40 mils per kilo. Um, and that brought it into the normal range, but it didn't 
um, it, it, it didn't actually cause any harm, which was one of the concerns that, that this might happen, that the harm being fluid overload. And so we built up um, over a series of trials. So not, we were able to show what was the best choroid to use. And, and by far, it was albumin that was coming out with a signal, particularly in children with cerebral malaria. But none of those had been done in a, a, a controlled trial. So we actually need to do, go out and do a controlled trial saying some children need fluids, other ch children don't. And so we have been applying and applying and, and don't let the reviewers negative comments get you down in my next lesson, because we have lots of people sitting on both sides of the with very, very strong opinions about you can't do this research in a place where you've got no intensive care, which basically means we can't progress the field. Or, you know, uh, we already know that these children are going to go into heart failure, even although we presented information for that. So, uh, you know, and there was also significant concerns of whether um, pediatricians would roll this out because there hadn't been any the equivalent sort of APLS type of training courses um, for these populations. I was supported by a children's charity fund and um, always think about never, never give up. Um, when you, you keep on, you must have submitted the FEAST trial many, many times. And, and I'd got personal recognition at Imperial College from my work. Um, I applied for a, 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 actually a, a reader's job and they actually pushed me up and gave me a professor's job. So I was, I was actually quite honored about that. But as I say, never, never give up. And it took uh, many times to resubmit this. And finally, with fantastic reviewers' comments, the MRC funded the FEAST trial. So we got this money, and but there was no off-the-shelf package of actually how to do this. There was no examples because it had never been done before. So we had to set up FEAST as an emergency care trial and try to do it to the very highest standard that you would accept around the world. And so we had to ensure that all children have the basic standard of care that included oxygen and antibiotics and you know, rapid doses of anti-malarials. So we upgraded the facilities that we were working in. Um, and, and we also did a lot of training. We did training, 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 recognizing the signs of uh, shock and, and the, the critically sick child, how to treat it, et cetera. And that was not a one-stop shop. We did it throughout the trial. We also developed a, an ethical way of getting the sickest of patients into the trial where we would approach mothers or fathers saying, we're doing this research. We've already got a, 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 an approval by the, the, the highest authorities in the country. Can we proceed? And we'll give you the information later. And many were happy to do that because as reading out a two to three page consent form or getting them to read that, when the, the, all they can think about is, please just save my child's life. Um, is we felt thought was unethical. So we got um, a, a basically deferred consent. We had an independent ethic uh, review board. We didn't see the accumulating data. So as, as trialists, we don't get to see that. It's only the inter independent data monitoring committee that get to see this. And after five interim reviews, um, after nearly 3,000 patients have been enrolled, uh, they phoned me back and said, fluid boluses can be of no benefit. Um, I burst out crying. I thought, crikey, what have I done? Children weren't receiving fluid boluses before this. Um, and, you know, what was the result? Um, we stopped the trial immediately, the TSC did. And a few months later, we were honoured to have this publication in the New England Journal. Not only were fluid boluses, which was a standard of care throughout the world, not only were they harmful, you can see both albumin and saline had 10% 48-hour mortality. Um, the actual no bolus was substantially, uh, significantly better not to get, actually give a, an additional fluid. They only received maintenance fluid. We were com we'd been looking for uh, signs of heart failure all the way through the trial, and we weren't seeing those. So we felt very confident that we weren't seeing this. So we, in a subsequent analysis of the data, we actually looked at what was happening. We found that no uh, children who received a, a bolus of fluid did reverse their shock, which is one hour uh, shock reversal is what it was much better than a bolus versus control. Um, and we show, showed there was, but that did not translate to a mortality benefit um, as, as recommended in the sepsis guidelines. What we showed is that children actually reversed their shock and then went back into catastrophic, uh, unreversible shock. 
Um, so, um, which is basically cardiovascular collapse, not from fluid overload, but just that they were just unresuscitatable. And we didn't see any excess respiratory events, in other words, indicating they've got pulmonary edema or neurological events. So here we are nearly two decades later, um, we did this big trial, uh, we produced the evidence that's led on to further funding, and we see that um, almost 20 years later, nearly all of these uh, 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 studies, these, these recommendations in the guideline have had large phase three trials um, addressing the, the, some of the, the issues. So uh, this is getting towards the end, but uh, number five, choose your collaborators as well and stick with the winning formula. And we have been working since the FEAST trial on a, a whole range of uh, trials. Um, we won an award for the FEAST trial. This is the BMJ paper of the award. And I just want to point out, there's a lot of girl power in my, team, in my collaborators. Uh, they were absolutely, they're fantastic, obviously. Uh, yes, we've we've had fantastic input from lots of uh, our male co uh, colleagues and experts, including our, our senior statistician, but uh, I've been very proud to have worked with such a wonderful group of uh, women. Um, and I think my, and my final lesson is it's got to be fun, um, and it has been, even although it's been very challenging. Thank you. Wow. I hope all of you enjoyed Professor Maitland's video as much as we did. An inspiring story that touches on science, healthcare, access, opportunity, and truly a lot of persistence in the face of challenges. A perfect fit for today's WISH event and the overall IWD theme of Choose to Challenge. Again, Professor Maitland is going to join us live on this webinar later for the Q&A session. So please post your comments and questions using the Zoom Q&A function. At this time, we're gonna take a brief break so everyone can rehydrate and stretch their legs. Please don't log off from the call. You can just leave your computer connected through Zoom. After the break, we'll have another special guest as well as our main event, an overview of the research being done by the first round of EOCD seed grant winners. We'll see you back here at 1010 AM. Welcome back everyone. We're going to continue with our next special guest for the NUHS WISH International Women's Day Conference 2021 webinar. Mrs. Sarah Huggett is Business Development Director, Open Science Solutions for Asia Pacific at Elsevier based in Singapore. In this role, she partners with government agencies, funding bodies, and academic institutions to help them realize their open science ambitions. In her previous role as Head of Analytical Services for APAC at Elsevier, she led a team analyzing research performance to offer insights and recommendations to research leaders planning for the future. Previously, she worked in Elsevier's research and academic relations team in Oxford, UK, which gave her expertise in using data to inform strategic planning. Sarah has a particular interest in new developments in open science and research evaluation, as well as a passion for inclusion and diversity. After completing bachelor's and master's degrees at the University of Grenoble, France, Sarah moved to the UK to teach French at the University of Oxford prior to joining Elsevier in 2006. Throughout her subsequent career at Elsevier, she has actively participated in the Elsevier Women Network, recently rebranded as the Thrive Employee Resource, Resource Group, assuming leadership of the Singapore chapter in 2018. In her spare time, Sarah enjoys spending time with her husband and four children, currently ranging in age from zero to 10. Sarah, we look forward to hearing your talk on the researcher journey through a gender lens. Over to you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today. And I feel very humbled to follow after Professor Maitland's inspiring presentation. Today, I would like to share with you, uh, can I just check that everybody can see the screen? Yes, good. So today I'd like to share with you a little bit about my personal, professional and inclusion and diversity journey. And then I would also like to tell you about the researcher journey for a general lens and what we have uncovered in terms of analytics by gender 
uh, in terms of participation, representation, research footprints, etc., etc. So let's get started. First, uh, we'll have three parts in this presentation. The first uh, existential question, why I'm here. Second, we'll go into um, these analytical insights that I mentioned. And finally, I'd like to touch upon things that we can do to improve gender equity in STEM, in particular, reflecting upon what Elsevier is doing. So let's get started with the first part. Who am I and why I'm here? So you may have noticed that uh, I work for Elsevier. You can see our logo at the bottom left-hand corner of this slide. And uh, I'm sure some of you will have heard about us as a scientific publisher. For example, Professor Maitland mentioned uh, she saw a job ad in The Lancet, that's one of our journals. And then I was uh, honored to see actually this very same logo on one of the screenshots of her, present, of her publications. So I know she's published with, her, with us before. So we're quite well established as a scientific publisher. Something that is not necessarily well known is that we're also an information analytics company. And thanks to the vast amount of data that uh, we have and we curate, we're actually able to create some very valuable insights, uh, some of which um, we sell commercially, but a lot of which we release publicly, such as, for example, the researcher journey through the agenda lens. So let's first reflect um, a little bit on my early path and my path to Elsevier. So you can see on the map, there is a little red pin and it says romans sur isère That is the small French town in which I grew up in the Southeast of France. It's absolutely beautiful there, um, but it is a small town. And then I moved to study English at the University of Grenoble, the second white dot on the, on the right hand side. And that was a real awakening because it was moving to the big city. Uh, then I went to have one exchange year in Reading in England, and that was really a big discovery again, uh, moving to a completely different country and learning about different cultures and different ways of thinking. And I loved it. So I came back to France and then I was thinking, how can I go back to England, right? Because I enjoyed it so much. And I found this opportunity to teach French at the University of Oxford. So I did that and I... I, um, it was beautiful. The students were absolutely lovely. And then I also taught English as a foreign language as well as French. And that's when I started to reflect on what do I want to do in life, uh, which I didn't really know. And that's at the point uh, in time at which Elsevier opened its arms to me. Um, so in you can see I was in Oxford. You can see beautiful skyline on the bottom left-hand side of the slide. And the roles in blue were basically working for the strategy group, doing a lot of data analysis, in particular bibliometrics and research performance to help inform the company strategy, in particular in terms of um, our publishing sides. How can we help improve our journal's performance, for instance? And that was really fascinating. I learned so much about um, research and the publishing cycle and research evaluation and such. And then in 2014, I took the opportunity to move to Singapore for a role in the product organization, uh, working fully on delivering the research insights to our customers about how their research performance is going, um, potentially highlighting collaborators, maybe areas, to prioritize the research strategy, et cetera, et cetera. And most recently, uh, I left the product group and I moved to this brand new role in sales because Elsevier is now helping um, to support our customers with open science ambitions should they want to um, think about open access and how they can work with us on this. So this is uh, the latest role. So along the way, I'd like to share a few personal highlights. I got married in 2009. My first son was born in 2011, second one in 2013, uh, my daughter in 2017, and our last son was born in 2020, just last year. So he's a pandemic baby. Um, and very cleverly, I'm astounded that he's actually learned to recognize a smile, even if you're wearing a mask. So if you smile at him and you're wearing a mask, he'll still smile back at you. I think that's incredibly clever, um, but I digress. So that was my uh, 
my journey in parallel there's also been this inclusion and diversity awakening so growing up in the southeast of france in the 80s in a small town i didn't realize it but um actually things were quite unequal in terms of gender balance um and and there was quite a lot of sexism around i just didn't realize it until i left and um when i went to uh, Oxford and then I was in Elsevier there was this Elsevier women's network and that's a wonderful beautiful organization so we have about 8,000 employees worldwide and the employee the women's network is just a group of women all around the world that are just passionate about gender equality and that are creating local chapters at which we can discuss these topics, just talk amongst ourselves, see what kind of initiatives we can do. This is fully supported by the company. So I was a member in Oxford. And then when I moved to Singapore, I continued to be a member. That was a great way to get to meet local colleagues. Um, and I had the fantastic opportunity to be the analytical lead for our first gender report, gender in the global research landscape. And I learned so much about um, the differences between men and women in research and how perhaps um, they might be faced with different challenges. And the report was such a success, we decided to do another one and I contribute to, contributed to this one as well. And that's the results I present today, the researchers through a gender lens. And then what happened in parallel is that I somehow ended up being the chair of the Thrive single report chapter. So Thrive is um, the rebranded Elsevier Women's Network because it's a little bit more inclusive. And um, I didn't assume leadership totally by choice, to be completely honest. Uh, it just happened that people left the company and then some people got sick. And then as they said, there was one. So uh, the leadership fell on me and I'm so glad that it did because I wouldn't have thought of volunteering, but it's been such a fantastic opportunity to make a change in our company and beyond and network and mix so, so many wonderful women. So Elsevier is very supportive of uh, gender balance. We have actually more than half of our employees that are women, 51% to this date. And we're involved in a lot of initiative related to gender equality. So for example, we support the gender summits. Um, we are keen on um, making sure our publication devotes the right attention to gender. And we also have our own internal um, work whereby we try to enforce that we have unbiased hiring processes, training everyone so that we can be um, aware of potential unconscious biases, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'm showcasing the reports again because all of these reports that you see on the screen are actually publicly available. So if you're ever curious about accessing some of the data or the analysis, um, you can just search for Elsevier Agenda and you'll be able to access any of these publications. So let's dive into the analytics uh, and uh, look at the research and the journey through a gender lens. First of all, let's talk about research participation, by which we mean the um, extent to which men and women participate in research. So first of all, the good news. Uh, we did a survey of researchers and 61% felt that there are more women in research now compared to 10 years ago. So that's the good news. And even better, it's substantiated by data. So when you look at the gender ratio uh, among authors, we can see um, that there are now more women towards the top than there were in the past uh, across all of the countries that we examined. However, when you look at the people that won grants, then you can see that um, there are less women among grant awardees than there are among research authors in general. So on the charts, you can compare awardees, which are the orange dots, authors uh, divided into corresponding authors in blue, first authors in dark purple, and last authors in pink and then uh, combine together. And then what you can clearly notice is that um, there is some influence potentially on seniority because we can see that for grant awardees, the ratio is more similar 
to um, last authors than it is to all authors. This is, shows the representation of women among patent applicants. And quite shockingly, you can see how low it is. There has been some progress done in some of the countries in particular. But in all of the geography we surveyed, it's still less than one in five patent applicants is a woman. So let's move beyond research participation and look at the research footprint, by which we mean how the men and the women that are working in research are contributing. So if you look at publication, you can see that on average, men tend to publish more than women in terms of number of publications per author. When you look at the citation impact of the publications, which is typically used in, as an indicator of research performance, you can see, however, that there is very little difference. So even if women tend to publish fewer papers um, than men, the citation impact of these papers is very similar. When women are first authors, we can see some difference in that men tend to be cited more. And we can speculate as to the reasons why. For example, um, it has been argued in the literature that there are these old boys clubs uh, of citation networks whereby established senior male researchers would kind of preferentially cite each other. Uh, so that could be a contributing factor as to why we see fewer citations for the publications of women when they're first authors. If you look at grant awards, that was interesting because we've seen that there were fewer grant awardees that were women than men. And these women actually get fewer grants than the men do. So not only are there fewer women um, that are uh, applying, applying for grants, they're also receiving less. And if you look at the patent applications, not only are there fewer women that are patent applicants, but they also file fewer patents in general too. So if we go further, we can look at publishing careers and mobility in particular. So what we see is that um, women cease to publish at a higher rate than men. So from this, we can infer that women would leave the world of research at a higher rate than men. And by looking at a cohort of researchers that we would follow through time, right? Um, and at the time where they stopped to publish, basically. So what that could tell us is it's, it could refer to this leaky pipeline that had been alluded to, whereby it seems that the pipeline is leakier for women than for men. Now, if we look at performance in terms of research across space rather than time, we can see that men tend to publish more internationally than women. So for this, we're looking at um, the percentage of men or women that have a publication with an affiliation outside of their country of origin, with country of origin be determined as the country of their uh, first publication, right? And this is important because we know that through international um, travel and relocation, researchers are able to expand their network, typically raise their citation performance and such. So um, if women publish less internationally, it could mean potentially that they would have less visibility, a smaller, more reduced network, and that could have consequences for their further research performance. So we also undertook uh, surveys to think about perceptions about gender. And clearly there are differences into, the gen into how the gender issue is perceived between each gender. So these are the results to the question, in my organization, women have to perform better than men to be considered good at their job. And you can see the breakdown for each of the fields with the women in green, and the men in blue. And regardless of the field in which you look, you can clearly see that uh, women feel that this statement is true 
a lot more than men do. Similarly, when we asked how important is it to have gender diversity in the research workplace, you can see that women feel that it's um, extremely important at a higher rate than men. It's quite encouraging though that there's a large proportion of men that feel it is very important still. So in conclusion, we've shown that there has been progress in increasing women's representation in research to some extent, but diversity and inclusion for women is still lacking in many respects. And so that allowed us to identify some opportunities for accelerating this change. For example, increasing the representation of women in physical sciences especially, but across all geographies. And special attention needs to be given to grantees and patent applicants. We could also see um, that there could be efforts to boost this international mobility uh, and also to try and retain women and um, help them to stay in research careers if they want to. Finally, because of the differences in perception, communication about the value of gender equity in research is also needed. So finally, what can we do to improve gender equity in STEM? It's one thing to look at the data and point out what the issues are. So how can we start to actually move the needles on some of these issues? And for this, I'd like to share some of the efforts that Elsevier has been undertaking. So since um, 2018, I believe, we have a new CEO, Kumsal Bayezid. She's a woman of Turkish descent. And she's been putting a lot of emphasis on inclusion and diversity. So on the right hand side, you can see our beautiful inclusion and diversity tree, uh, which reminds us of all of the aspects of diversity of which we should be mindful. Some of which are more visible than others closer to the roots and others being higher up may be more difficult to see. And so these are some of the recent efforts that Elsevier has been doing through our Elsevier Foundation, the analytics and gender reports we've talked about. We're also working on improving gender data in our systems, uh, sex and gender-based analysis in research studies, working on diversity in conferences and journal editorial boards, doing some research on gender in peer review, et cetera, et cetera. So here are a few examples. So the Elsevier Foundation is basically um, a charitable organ arm of our organization. And since 2012, we have recognized 45 women scientists from 20 countries. You can see the winners of this year's um, grants. And basically it's a way to award uh, women with a prize, give them further visibility as well as the grant money to help them to continue um, in their outstanding research efforts. We're also studying um, gender in research. So, for example, we've looked at research across each of the sustainable development goals. And in each of these um, corpora, what the share is of publications that include sex or gender consideration. So as you would expect, nearly all of them in uh, the gender equality sustainable development goal. 61% in good health and well being, which is good, but is it enough? Shouldn't that be 100%? Um, still, if you go down the list, you can see how um, little sex or gender consideration there is in many of the areas of research related to the SDGs. Um, and that is quite striking in particular, as we know that women tend to be disproportionately impacted uh, by some of the negative factors that the SDGs are meant to address. So that's just something to bear in mind. And um, that's something on which we can continue to educate um, researchers so that going forward, they include more and more sex and gender considerations in the design of their research projects. We've also looking at studying uh, gender in peer review, trying to see if there is a, a bias in peer review because we have seen that there is anecdotal evidence of reviewers or editors sometimes um, showing prejudice against uh, women. Um, Professor Maitland herself mentioned a few um, 
of the feedback that she has received throughout her career. So we examined uh, whether there was a uh, correlation between the outcomes of peer review and the gender of the authors on 145 journals. And we didn't, um, we didn't find any uh, systematic one in, in this one. Uh, that isn't to say it doesn't exist. Uh, we just couldn't find uh, evidence of a um, systematic correlation. When we looked at studying gender and COVID, however, we could definitely see that there is um, a big impact and that women tend to be disproportionately impacted, especially by um, lockdown or circuit breaker measures. So that one is only a preprint. It has to be uh, still published. Um, but what we saw on our manuscript submission and review system in our journals was that when COVID started to hit, women started to submit fewer and fewer papers. And um, actually, we're seeing, depending on the country, that this hasn't, this hasn't uh, quite stopped yet. So some of the things we're doing is uh, looking at gender data in our own systems. Um, and in particular, there's two I would like to showcase today. On the right hand side, we, you can see an example of our journal homepage project. And what we're aiming to do is, uh, right now it's only for a subset of our journals, but by the end of the year, we're hoping it will be for all of our journals. We're going to show the gender diversity distribution of our editorial boards on each of our journal homepages. So you can see how many percent of the boards are women and men or other. And then we also benchmark this across the gender diversity distribution uh, across the portfolio. So you can see how that compares uh, with the other journals that we host. Um, I think this is really, really um, important in terms of transparency and also in terms of incentivizing our editors to continue to be mindful of gender diversity and inclusion on our boards. And it also helps us when we see um, for instance, that maybe the results are not as balanced as we would like, to have an evidence-based discussion with our editors to encourage recruiting more women, or in fields such as nursing, maybe recruiting more men. We've also been working on the gender conference of the gender balance of our conference speakers. And here you can see our journey from 2015 to 2020. I think it's amazing and I couldn't quite believe it, but in 2015, across the conferences organized by Elsevier, we had only 15% of women speakers. Uh, I was shocked, I didn't know that. And look at the progress we've made all over the years uh, by simply being mindful and more inclusive in our invitations to our speakers where we are now at uh, 40 to 60% uh, balance for 2020. For 2021, we're also at 40 to 60% and we're aiming to continue on our efforts on this. I'm very, very proud of what our company is doing in this sphere. So finally, I mentioned very briefly Thrive, which is our employee resource group for gender equity at Elsevier. And these are some of the things that we've been doing. Um, so we've all struck the uh, choose to challenge pose for uh, International Women's Day. We had some social media campaign. Our company gave us this beautiful, um, this beautiful templates that we could use um, we had some virtual meetings. We're going to have a screening of the pictures of a scientist movie. There was a Kahoot quiz with some uh, elements about the development of gender equality throughout the world. Um, and I think these are really, really good in fostering a culture that is mindful of gender differences at Elsevier and helping us to be to continue to be main, mindful of gender differences and, and trying to create an environment that is uh, welcoming to all genders. And this concludes my presentation today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing your story and these data. Healthcare and science are big fields extending beyond the university's academia. And it's the whole ecosystem that will be required to make the big changes for the future, whether it's for equity in terms of gender, opportunity, and access to and benefit from scientific research. So thank you for all of your efforts at Elsevier in this direction. And so again, another reminder, we'll do our Q&A session after this next segment. So post your comments or questions using the Zoom Q&A function. Thanks, Swain.
Now as promised, we're going to keep with the theme of promoting research into equity for gender, opportunity and career development. We have two presentations by the first round of grant recipients from the NUS Equal Opportunities and Career Development Office. Have you ever wondered why there are so few men in the nursing profession? Um, maybe not. Or have you heard of imposter syndrome and in with whom or where it is most prevalent? Stay tuned to find out. Associate Professor Gan Yun Huen is another founding member of the NUHS WISH Group and recently took up an additional role as Assistant Dean, leading the EOCD office. She'll introduce the two grant recipients. Professor Gan, over to you. Thank you, Melina and Swain. So good morning, friends and colleagues. I'm very happy today to be able to introduce our grant call winners. But before that, I would like to share with you um, a little bit about our EOCD inaugural grant call. So this grant call was held last year in March 2020. In fact, it spanned the circuit breaker time, but it was very productive. We had several grant proposals uh, come in and we selected three. So I would like to take this opportunity to let you know about the purpose of this grant call. So we wish in this grant call to be able to encourage and promote research in gender issues so that we can help raise awareness and then try to identify issues that we can tackle and promote diversity and inclusion in our workplace. So we hope that through our reliable data that can be generated, uh, we can help plug some gaps and these data will also help us to guide policy adjustments and implementations, as well as to guide us in planning new training programs uh, to plug the relevant gaps. So I'm also very happy to take this opportunity to announce that the inaugural grant call will be also uh, extended to this year. So it's not inaugural anymore, but hopefully we will make it annual. So the grant call for EOCD seed grant 2021 uh, will likely come out April. So that means next month. So I do hope that you will keep a lookout for it and we welcome you to please submit your proposals to us. So each grant call is capped at a quantum of $10,000 for a maximum duration of two years. So we really hope for your, for your participation. So right now, I'm going to announce the grant call winners uh, that we have today uh, from last year. So there were three of them. Assistant Professor Hannah Kletman from the Sorcery Hawk School of Public Health. Uh, unfortunately, she's not able to join us today because uh, uh, she's on the medical leave. Her winning proposal is on gender representation in COVID-19 research and reporting in Singapore. So I'm sure we'll have, uh, we'll have the opportunity to hear her talk some other day. So, and we wish her a speedy recovery. So right now, I would like to introduce our next speaker and next grand call winner, and she's Dr. Zhou Wentao. So Dr. Zhou, she's a senior lecturer and the Master of Nursing Program Coordinator at the Alice Lee Center for Nursing Studies in NUS. And her winning proposal is on understanding the gender gap in advanced practice nursing. So over to you, Dr. Zhou. Hello, good morning. Thanks, Prof. Gan, for your kind introduction. Uh, good morning, colleagues and friends. I'm Wen Tao from Alice Lee Center for Nursing Study. Today, I would like to share uh, our study, which is understanding the gender gaps in advanced practice nursing. Uh, so it is very close to nursing, but it's not talking about women in this particular International Women's uh, Day Conference. We are grateful for receiving this grant. And this study is currently undergoing a US RRB reviewing. So we hope we quickly get the uh, uh, approval. We can embark on this study. In last year, two, July 2020, uh, Dr. Kutan has published or have uh, published a forum in the Straits Times. The title is Marking Nursing a National Service Vocation. So he stated that nursing is a key pillar of total defense 
in the light of pandemics and other healthcare shocks in the future. With this, I would like to bring everybody to look at Singapore's uh, uh, nursing manpower profile. In Singapore, we have about 5.69 million population. Currently, in our registration, there are 34,600 uh, registered nurses. And if you look at that, there is only about 11.2% of registered nurses a male. Okay, if you look here, nurses to population ratio in Singapore is about 1 to 133 population. It's equivalent about 7.5 nurses taking care of 1,000 population. Among all these registered nurses, we do have some advanced practice nurses who are when, uh, under trained for the uh, under tr a special training. There are about 267 in overall. Uh, for this year, we just have another 37 join the uh, join the pool of advanced practice nurses. But among all, there are only 15 of them, which is in is is about. 5.6% of the overall advanced practice nurses. And these 15 um, male advanced practice nurses is only about 0.4 overall male nurses in Singapore. So there is a clear gender gap in nursing. It is an indisputable fact. We need more nurses in Singapore, recruiting more male nurses is a notable trend to meet the higher demand of care complexity and the healthcare revolution. Why there is not so many males in nursing? In a history, it is recruiting and returning males in nursing profession has been a challenge globally in the past and now. Despite public acceptance, a number of males in nursing improving, the proportion of male advanced practice nurses is still low. So advanced practice nurses are referring to registered nurses acquired expert knowledge, complex decision-making skills, and clinical competencies for extended practice. They do diagnose, manage common and complex chronic conditions collaboratively with other healthcare professionals. So there are a few questions need to be answered. First, is it necessary to narrow the gender gap for nursing? Is it possible to narrow the gaps? Why aren't there more males joining nursing force? Why is it important to have more male nurses in our healthcare setup? How to improve recruiting and retention more male nurses in our workforce? Will more male advanced practice nurses attract more males to join nursing? So these are the few questions actually in mind uh, before we embark and decided to do this study. So let us look at some factors that affects males to join nursing. There are a lot of social perception, stigmas and bias they all thought nursing is a female profession. And also patients kind of prefer care provided uh, by female instead of male. So male nurses are not well accepted in the female social cliques environment. And also role strain from stereotypes of masculinity for male. But of course, there are other factors to encourage retention of male nurses. First, male nurses will be returned in the profession if the profession is accepting them. They stay in the profession. Most of them feel a sense of belonging and supported by the female colleagues. And they also find meaning of being a nurse, sense of being needed in this profession 
and provide diversifying population care. And also, they will return in this profession if they would be valued for their diverse ideas and creative ways of thinking from the opposite gender. There are a lot of potential benefits to have more males in nursing. First, we have more nurse, male nurses in the workforce that will be improved. Uh, the relationship within um, intra-profession, inter-profession, cross-professional colleagues. And also, they, more male nurses in the workforce, they can work in some of the specialty areas which are more physically demanding, such as mental health, disaster response in certain kind of uh, uh, situation. And also encourage diversity in nursing workforce and nursing care cultures, create new innovative ideas to embrace healthcare changes. So our studies, our study aims to explore the perception of the APNs, APN interns, and APN students towards the shortage of males in the APN profession, and to understand their views of the selection and recruitment of the male uh, registered nurses into the advanced uh, uh, into the master of nursing program, is to explore whether more male advanced practice nurses can elevate the nursing professional image. So the methodology we adopt is we are going to do exploratory qualitative study. We are going to use maximum variation sampling uh, method that is to really have a diversity opinion on this topic. And also uh, we will try to get about 20 participants uh, until the data gets saturated. We will do individual single session in that semi-structured interview, either through face-to-face -face or video conference. The findings will be analyzed by use thematic analysis. So the significance of the study will be actually help us to understand why there are so few men in advanced practice nursing and to be aware of existing barriers faced by the males which deter, uh, deters them from pursuing this profession. And also to improve uh, or to develop strategies to see how we can, um, uh, can, can further improve uh, to have more advanced practice uh, uh, nurses, to have more males advanced, uh, advanced practice nurses to join our workforce. And that will be help balance the gender diversity in this nursing profession. I would like to end my short presentation actually by showing this article, uh, which is an interview to a male leader from Tantosing Hospital. Currently, she's an NHG uh, uh, cluster chief nurse. Um, he stated the future of nursing and there is a lot of great ideas have been discussed, but I'm impressed by this sentence. As a nurse, we have a lot of things to be proud of. So I really hope with this opportunity at this era after COVID pandemic, we will welcome more and more male, uh, males join in our nursing profession. So I would like to end my this presentation by thanks Prof. Emily Ang for supporting this study and thanks assist, uh, Assistant Professor Wilson Tan for stimulate me to think about this idea and thanks Dr. Bridget for working together with me for this study. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zhou. Thanks. Uh yeah, thank you. That is a fantastic talk and we are really looking forward to the outcome of your study. You know, I remember that when I was a little girl in kindergarten and when the kindergarten teacher was asking the, the children, what do you want to be? And then so many of the girls said, I want to be a nurse. 
And then all the boys said, I want to be a doctor, <laughs> you know? And so I think we do have a long way to go with that perception uh, and changing the society perception of this. So thank you very much. Now with that, I would like to move on and introduce our next grant call winner as well as speaker for today. And he's Dr. Ling Zheng Jai, and he is the Assistant Director of Medical Informatics in Regional Health Systems from NUHS. And Dr. Ling's winning proposal is on the prevalence and impact of imposter phenomenon among NUHS staff. It is very exciting. We are all intrigued by this, especially since uh, we are talking about the imposter syndrome among us. So without further ado, Dr. Ling, over to you. Thank you for having me and the lovely introduction. Um, so I'd just like to introduce my, my team's research for, for this grant call. It's on the prevalence of imposter syndrome in a health system and the impact of imposter phenomenon on uh, burnout, sick and hospitalization days. And before I continue, I'd just like to highlight that my team is uh, composed of myself and three other fantastic uh, lady analysts who were not here today, uh, who couldn't make it today. So they have uh, democratically put me up to uh, present on their behalf. So yeah, so just keep, keep that in mind that this is really a very, very interesting study that uh, came out from the work of the team. So this may be the first time that some of you are hearing about imposter phenomenon. So I'd just like to go through it briefly. If you've been following pop culture, you may have uh, heard of it in various terms. Sometimes it's called imposter syndrome as well. And, uh, but formerly it's also known as imposter phenomenon. It's been around since 1978 and it was first coined by two psychologists. And, and it's the psychological experience of believing that your accomplishments have come uh, not through, not by your genuine ability, but as a result of having been lucky, uh, having manipulated other people's impressions or other external factors. So to put it in uh, more human experience terms, it's let's say you get an award, right? As you get the award, you think to yourself, I don't really deserve this. Um, I don't really know why they gave this to me. I'm a, I was just lucky this time, right? And so you diminish that, that uh, sense of accomplishment. You know, you don't own that achievement. You attribute it to other things. And you can see how that feeling might spill over to negatively affect your work performance as well, especially if it's uh, tied to your role as compared to a once-off award. So just imagine like, again, you've been appointed team leader and you have these same feelings of uh, imposter phenomenon where you wonder to yourself, am I really good enough? You know, actually my, my subordinate is more capable than me. They should be leading the team instead of me. So, and, and all these other negative self-critical talk this can of course add on to your mental load at work and possibly lead on to things like burnout and other things which we will talk about later. And over the years, um, the literature has shown that it's more pervasive in women and ethnic minorities. So if we just look at the study that was done in American medical students, the percentage of female students who displayed imposter phenomen phenomenon was double that of their male counterparts and as you move along the, the training and uh, career path, right? So from female medical students to physicians and specialty physicians in training, that uh, increased rate of imposter phenomenon uh, holds true. It continues to be significantly far ahead of their male counterparts. And likewise for minorities, a systematic review found that um, rates of imposter phenomenon are high among minorities and it's also comorbid with impaired job performance, job satisfaction, burnout, uh, anxiety symptoms and also depression. So when we surveyed the literature, we also realized that most of the literature has been done in the West, uh, a little in Asia and there's only one study in Singapore, which is why we decided to turn our attention to this and see what it's like over here in NUHS. 
So again, just to talk a bit more about imposter syndrome, and this was uh, retrieved off Twitter. So it's when you go into a work meeting, right? And you sit at the table and you look at everyone else, you know, and you think, wow, everyone knows so much more than me. And what I know is just a little segment of what they know, when actually it's far more likely to be the other picture, the one that looks like a flower, right? I know things, other people know what I know, but they also don't know what I might know, right? And if you just change that verb know to like skill, ability, there are things that I can do that other people cannot do. There are things that they can do that I cannot do. And it's okay. This is just part of working in a team, right? And so as part of preparing for this presentation, I've been asked a few times as to why, why did we choose to study imposter syndrome or imposter phenomenon? And for myself, I think uh, it was a really uh, a light bulb moment for me when I realized that this phenomenon existed. Because when I first started out my career um, as a medical informatician, when medical IT people were rare, I would sit in a room, I'll look at the senior IT folk, and I will say, I'll tell myself, I don't know as much about IT as they do. Then I'll look at the senior clinicians in the room who are working on the electronic medical record. And I'll say, I just started on my career. I'm not even like 10% as good a doctor as they are. So then what am I doing here? You know, like there are these two perfectly capable people here and I'm like just a, a hanger on, right? And I also started to notice this in some of my other colleagues as well. Uh, and friends. I was talking to a friend at work once and I asked him about his job and I asked him, what do you do at work? He said, oh, I'm an actor. Basically, I just go there and I just act. Oh, I just act in a meeting. I reassure people. Actually, I don't really know what I'm talking about. And I was like, wow, that's just so striking. Uh, such a striking, succinct explanation of how he felt, how imposter phenomenon affected him. And I've, I've also known other colleagues extremely capable, extremely talented, wonderful ladies. So um, like they're setting an exam paper for students, right? And, and so in the course of the review of the paper, uh, some people raise questions like, hey, there are alternative answers to these questions. What do you think? And, and so after the review, the, you know, the review of the test paper, I thought, okay, I mean, these are fair and valid comments and it's interesting. But when I spoke to my colleague, she felt really badly about it. She was like, oh man, I should have set a better paper. Am I really, you know, sometimes I really wish like I, I wasn't in this job. You know, I, I don't feel like I'm good enough for this job. If I had been better, the paper would have uh, less mistakes, what she called mistakes, right? When actually they're just valid alternative answers. So I explored it a bit with her and I said, so if, if this wasn't a paper you set and you were looking at it for the first time, would you say that there are more, uh, you know, more of these uh, mistakes than compared to, let's say, another paper? Then she thought about it and she said, no. Then I said, oh, then it's not that bad a paper, right? When you think about it, it's not like bottom 50th percentile, you know, it's not like below the median. And so, you know, that's just how an example of how imposter phenomenon can just pop up and just really afflict you in like your consciousness and your, your perception of your work and your morale as well. So what we hope to do, my team and I here, we hope to determine what's the prevalence here in uh, NUHS of imposter phenomenon, whether there are gender and ethnic differences in prevalence, um, whether this phenomenon is associated with burnout and whether or not it's associated with sick and hospitalization days as a proxy for um, work, workplace impact. So based on the literature, we, we think that we are going to see that women and ethnic minorities are more likely to have imposter phenomenon and that for those who have imposter phenomenon, experience imposter phenomenon, they're more likely to experience burnout. And for those who experience imposter phenomenon, they're also more likely to take sick and hospitalization days compared to those who don't. So 
how we are going to do this is that we are going to send a mass email to our NUHS colleagues every two weeks for about three months. And, you know, just as an early pitch before you, you guys get an email, this is not a female only study. We do need males as well. So when you, when you see that email, please uh, join in uh, and do the 20 minute questionnaire and, you know, encourage your colleagues as well to do it. It's completely anonymized. We will not know who you are. Um, and it's uh, pretty rigorous, uh, the way it's been set up. There's pretty much no way we can re-identify you. And so we'll just ask you a few questions about, um, about yourself in terms of the demographics, whether you have any pre-existing chronic conditions, because we, we need that to adjust for the sick and hospitalization leave bit. And then we'll go on to administer the CLANS imposter phenomenon scale, which is a standardized instrument that's been used in some of these studies on imposter phenomenon. And we'll also use the Maslach burnout inventory uh, general survey to, to assess uh, symptoms of burnout. And so that's where we are at with uh, our, our study. And we hope to get this email out to you and we look forward to your responses. Thank you. Congratulations and thank you to all the EOCD grant recipients. The WISH Committee has been working with the EOCD office and we're all excited about the work that you have proposed and we look forward, forward to further updates from your research. We're now going to bring all of our speakers together in a common Q&A session. Please continue to post your comments and questions. We see that there's some already in the Q&A session and we'll try to get to as many as we can. So to start it off, we have a question for both Professor Maitland and Mrs. Huggett from the Q&A box. Um, I think Professor Maitland is with us. Has she been able to log on at, it's 5 a.m. her time in Cape Town, South Africa. So we hope she's able to join us on time. If not, uh, Mrs. Huggett, maybe you'd like to take the question first. We're living during a time when the healthcare and science workforce is increasingly global and mobile. You've both experienced moves during your careers. What is the impact on women's careers and how can it be mitigated? Sarah, perhaps you'd like to answer the question first. You could unmute yourself. Yes. Sorry, Sarah. Um, that's a really good question. Now, obviously, I can't speak for all women, but reflecting on my personal experience, international mobility has definitely helped me to advance my career. So I shared that I grew up in a small town in the southeast of France. Career prospects over there are very depleted. Um, the fact that I studied English actually was really helpful because it allowed me to move to um, Oxford. Um, when I grew up, not everybody could speak English at all where I come from. Um, and that was one of the first factors that allowed me to work effectively for an international company, the fact that I could uh, have a sufficient proficiency in English. And I, I was okay, I did quite well in Oxford, uh, but then when the opportunity came to move to Singapore, even though at the time it was technically a step down on the career ladder, it offered me some other opportunities that I could never have achieved if I had stayed in Oxford. So things like um, the opportunity to, leave in the, in, in, to move into uh, leadership and management as the previous team expanded, um, the opportunity to move in a leadership role with the Thrive Group, for example, because, I mean, we have a lot of leaders in Oxford, but in Singapore, it's a much smaller office um, with a much more um, higher level of turnover. So these opportunities I wouldn't have had. I, I, also, I also wouldn't have had half the cultural awareness that I have because of the fantastic opportunity to work uh, across the whole of the Asia Pacific region. So after having worked with Europe and America, I was able to expand my horizon and understand better how people can come from such um, different environments. So I believe that um, if anybody has international ambition, 
it's very important that they should be able to follow up on them, whether they're a man or a woman. And for me, what really did it is just simply networking and casually making it um, known that I was willing to relocate, that I was not necessarily tied to the place that I was. If I hadn't been proactive about this, I would have missed out because my professors would not have informed me about the um, teaching position at Oxford University. And then when I was in Elsevier, my colleague would not have reached out to tell me, hey, I'm hiring somebody in Singapore, would you like to apply? So to my opinion, it's all about being open about your intentions and desires and, and your, um, what you're willing to do for your career. And then if you network enough, it will help maximize your chances of such opportunities. Thank you very much, Sarah. And um, Professor Maitland, um, thank you for being with us so bright and early in the morning. Oh, could you answer that question on mobility? I'd just like to share a little piece of trivia with you and the rest of the audience. Professor Maitland was born in Liverpool, am I correct? That's correct, yes. I did my doctorate with the University of Liverpool, so I thought that would be an icebreaker for trivia this morning, and I hand over the question to you now. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm dialing in from Cape Town, but I normally live on the coast of Kenya um, in a, a small town called Kalifi. Um, so I, my, my View, my vision many, many years ago, as I presented in my talk, was to do global health and you've got to, you've got to move. You can't study malaria um, in a population if you're sitting in Oxford, so we had to move. Um, and also, um, I started my family there. And so uh, the, the ability for me to be able to conduct studies in, uh, in, in Vanuatu, where I, I first started Global Health, um, and also bring my family along. I think that that was, that was positive rather than a, uh, a negative. Um, and so, so I, um, yes, I, ha I had to be able to move. I mean, the other thing that I also tried to sort of put across, that the, the model at that time was the that uh, it was usually the man that went out and the wife that helped them. And, um, and that was still very much um, prominent in people's minds that I was there helping my husband rather than having an equal partnership. It, although there was no problem between my husband, Tom Williams and myself. Um, that's one of the reasons why I maintained my, uh, my maiden name, um, uh, Maitland, because I wanted to be seen to be, I'm independent, I'm not Mrs. Williams. Um, and so, uh, yes, uh, um, and then having done my three years in, uh, in Vanuatu, we came back. Um, I, I did some lab science, even although I was doing epidemiology. And I think that was really important because um, now I have an understanding of uh, how you, you do aspects of lab science. I'm often asked to, to review people's proposals um, that in, in involves that. So I, I understood the sort of rigor that you need to do to have that. And that was very much the advice of uh, Professor Sir David Weatherall, um, even although I was trying to concentrate on the epidemiology, I also rounded my skills in, in that area. Um, and then our next big challenge was to go to Africa. That was the heartbeat of malaria. That's where we needed to be. A little island in the South Pacific was never going to get me where I, I really wanted to be um, at the forefront of understanding the uh, severe malaria and how best to treat it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Malin. Again, thanks for coming on so early in the morning. And I think, you know, this sort of conjunction of kind of the scientific rigor and then also having some advice is something I think that uh, we'll come back to uh, in, a, in another question coming up a little bit later. But right now I'd like to turn to, we have another question from the Q&A box and this is for Dr. Zhou. So the question is, do you think the imposter syndrome, which was described by Dr. Ling, may be a factor for nurses, especially male nurses? Thank you. I think that is a great question. Um, I, I, in fact, when the time I look at that question, I sought to invite Dr. Ling to actually share his observation. Maybe he's already in that mood and start to do some observation. But if you ask me, 
there is a potential, but uh, I'm not certain. Yeah, so maybe I would like to extend this part into to put into my study and to see to further explore whether this imposter syndrome is happening in nursing. I'm so sorry I cannot give you a direct answer, but I will look forward to explore in my study. Thank you. Dr. Ling, do you have something to add in through your observation? <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. Um, so this would not be scientific. My opinion coming soon would not be scientific by any measure because that's what uh, Wenhao's research is for, you know, with the, the, uh, the, the quant qualitative uh, study of it and the actual in-depth interviews. But I, I think that in my experience, when I've interacted with, with male nurses, um, they, have, they have mentioned briefly and now that I'm forced to, you know, really dig through my memory, I think they have mentioned things that could be possibly construed as uh, imposter syndrome, where they felt that that uh, because they were male, they were they were different and perhaps sometimes not even good enough for certain certain roles in nursing. Uh. Yeah, certainly. Again, in my experience, sample size maybe. N equals to five, you know, five, five male nurses in the profession. They have mentioned that they, they don't feel like um, they can compete in terms of career progression simply because they are male and not, not female. Yeah, so I do think it's quite likely that we will find imposter syndrome in, in male nurses. And I think what would be interesting that is that it might possibly be flipped. That means the male nurses will experience more <laughs> imposter syndrome with regards to the nursing role than the female, the female nurses. So yes, that's uh, interesting and we should eventually get around to, to looking at it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I put you in to answer this question. Thank you so much. But I definitely will explore for this perspective. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Zhou, and uh, for Dr. Ling as well. It's lovely to see our participants interact with one another directly. I have a question for Dr. Ling. Um, the anecdotes that you shared, I think resonate with many people. Asking questions from your trainee about the paper she said seemed very effective. Can you talk more about some general strategies for mentoring or coaching those who seem to have imposter syndrome? Ah, so if you don't mind, I'd just like to use the the backup slide I prepared because uh, again, that, that came up a few times while I was preparing, but I didn't want to disrupt the organizers by suddenly sending in a last minute slide. So when it comes to managing imposter phenomenon, because it's a psychological experience, I, I think we can divide it into two approaches. There's the, the things that you can do for yourself and there are the things you can do to support others. So when it comes to um, managing its impact on you, one of the first things is to just recognize that it exists. And, and that was a real big step for me because when I recognized that, hey, this is a phenomenon, you know, it occurs possibly in one out of five people. I'm not the only person in the room who's experiencing it. That means that the, 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 doc, the, you know, the senior emeritus professor who's sitting at the same table with me with the IT guy, is probably looking at the two of us and like, I know nothing about IT. Why am I here representing my department? And the IT guy would also possibly be thinking, this is my first time handling an electronic medical record project. You know, <laughs> like these guys are doctors. So recognizing that there are these uh, feelings that can happen, that, they are, that it's a common experience and to find a safe space to share it with, I think that's... Uh, the first step really to uh, getting a, a grip on it. And of course, getting objective feedback is also useful. So like with my colleague, I, I practice some of this, right? I ask her, okay, so objectively, is the this supposed error rate, number one, is it really an error or it's just a variant answer? And number two, is this happening at a higher rate than usual? You know, out of like 10 questions, is it that all 10 questions needed rework? Or is it just like one or two questions out of like 10, right? Because that's an objective measure that then people can take, take back and absorb and like, oh yeah, you know, when I compare it, 
actually, you know, when I compare myself against what I've seen before, it's not that bad, right? One of the other things that um, that's also been very helpful for me is to reference your own personal career success inventory. So this sounds really grandiose, but it's basically your resume, right? When you when you write your resume, you're trying to put your best foot forward. You're trying to celebrate your successes. So, so that's what I would take it as, you know, when on those occasional times when you have to update your resume, it's a great time to just sit down, look, look back at your career and think, hey, what, was, what were some things that ran really well that I'm proud of that you can revisit? And so that helps you manage that sense of inadequacy because when that feeling rises up, you know, you have, you have a memory to challenge it with like, yeah, I feel, I feel this way about this particular presentation, but there was this other presentation where I did okay, right? And, and even though I might have felt as badly, later on, the things that I feared, the things that I was anxious about, they didn't happen. And then that ties in nicely with like self-compassion, right? You have to be kind to yourself. And of course, in science and academia, because there's this emphasis on precision, we, we can be a bit more critical than most people because we are like, oh, you know, it could have been this much better. There's an error rate and so on and so forth. But really, we are, we are all human, right? And again, like when I was talking to my colleague, I said, have you ever seen a paper where there was absolutely no feedback from the team and that there were no uh, variant answers at all? And, and my colleague thought about it and like, no. And I said, you've been doing this for like 10 years. And my colleague said, yeah, I've been doing this for 10 years and I've never seen a paper where, where there were no uh, corrections or errata or variant answers. Then I said, you know, you see, right? So you can be kind to yourself. The, the expectation of a perfect paper is somewhat unrealistic, uh, right? And again, the growth mindset that we can change, these are things that can be tackled, that we can grow in managing. Uh, that's also a helpful way of managing imposter phenomenon. And for those of us who are in teams or who are leading teams, I think healthy expectations can help to manage uh, imposter phenomenon among our colleagues, uh, celebrating our, our colleagues' achievements as well. Um, it's actually not that common to receive a compliment on your work. So I think it's really pleasant when, when you know, when I have the chance to give it to others. And I, I know I try to make it like specific and meaningful. Mentoring has uh, multiple impacts. And I think, again, this is important for managing imposter phenomenon because of the earlier points above. And we also have to create a culture where mistakes are not failures and they're just learning points and they're not disastrous career ending things. So that's just how we could manage imposter phenomenon individually and as a team. Thank you very much, Dr. Ling. I think these strategies are super useful to have a, a sort of set of things that we can think about and, and, and um, sort of managing not just uh, people we're mentoring, but also our, our peers. So we'd like to move on. And um, we have another question for Professor Maitland. So um, you shared during your talk some unfortunate and unfortunately, uh, you know, I would say very cliche and, you know, even though how recent it was, right? Some quite negative comments in your career uh, that were coming uh, re regarding your research career potential. So Currently, there's a focus on sponsoring, trying to sponsor women and finding those key points in their career where they can be supported and, and then that will help them uh, in their future career path. Do you see this as different to mentoring or role modeling? And would something like this have helped you at some of these key points where you were getting these sort of very um, sort of, you know, unfortunate uh, sort of unfair feedback in your own career? So, I mean, I think um, I, have got to where I am today through resilience and uh, and um, and also making um, sorry I can see you talking can you hear me you can hear me yeah okay thank you um so and um, and I, I I wish that that wasn't the case um, but I wouldn't have wanted to on the on the flip side um, have been given a um, 
recognition if I felt I didn't deserve it. So just because I was a woman. Um, and so there's a, there's a really fine balance there. Um, I think the world is a different place. You know, this was the 90s um, in the UK, and I think lots of other professions, um, particularly in our city of London, etc. Even you know the pay gap and lots and lots of, and that's some, some you know some, some areas that still um, occurs. You know that it, it really is a challenge. But I think where we are today is is much um, different. Um, we have a, a scheme in the UK, the Athena Swan, um, about uh, women in science, and universities are positively recognised for their 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 sort of you know their positions. You often see. At when you actually uh, look at um, the career advancements, you have um, obviously a huge diversity at a very junior level, then you move up to senior lecturers, you move up to readers, you move up to professions, and increasingly then th th there's a switch that, uh, you know, uh, quite a lot of positions are filled by males in those more senior positions than females. But I think with this critical awareness of you know wanting to be positively recognizing women's um uh contribution i think that that's that is beginning to change um but uh, you know i think it's it's something that um i think people have to get things on merit rather than just their gender which is um and i you know and i think that there are so many females there who will are of, um, in the in the world that you know do merit um, much greater recognition. Um, I, I wanted to just I know I'm talking a little bit about obviously um, career progression, but uh, one of the things I wanted to say about imposter syndrome and and uh, um, it's just an observation is that uh, if you've come from you know we come from a uh, an educational system in the UK where critical thinking is encouraged. Um, rather than a rote chalk and talk and, and, you know, and you have to learn things and not criticise your elders or professors, because if they're in a position like that, you can't question what they do. But, you know, in, in some of the places that I work, particularly in Africa, that's not the case. And sort of breaking out of that mould, you know, developing critical thinking, people find it very, very difficult to evaluate one piece of research, one paper that's published against another. You know, what are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? And, and they they that, that they find that a, a real struggle, and uh, I think that that mu must be part of education, where um, people to to advance their knowledge on something are, are able to critically look at um, what is published and 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 really think about the strengths and we and be encouraged to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof Maitland. Um, I hear, we all hear you talking about um, capability, merit, and definitely we would like to see that fairness rather than any form of um, um, influence in the sense that we're, again, biased by gender for, for females rather than men. It should not be the case. Thank you also for speaking about the Athena Swan movement. We aspire to that. It is one of our benchmarks. It's not quite present yet um, in our current work environment, but we read about it, we learn about it, and uh, we definitely like to know more and do more in that aspect. Um, I'd like to have um, now get, pose a question to Sarah. In countries where female authors did not publish less during the pandemic, do you know what they were doing? What were they doing right? for Sarah Huggett? That's a very good question. I wish I had the answer to that question. Um, as far as I recall, we did not really see any um, country by country difference in terms of um, countries in which um, women would be publishing the same level or submitting actually some of publication was about submission, right? Manuscript submission before publication. If I recall correctly, what we saw was that there was a lot of differences um, by gender, by field, and uh, I suspect by uh, seniority level and by age. Um, meaning that, um, and also I suspect there's also differences due to family status, right? So maybe the question is not so much what they were doing right, but more 
what kind of condition they were in that would have allowed them to be as um, as uh, prolific as they were before in terms of, of writing papers and submitting papers. And I think there's two different ways in which we can look at this, right? Because we noticed that they submitted fewer papers than men, so that's one thing. And then we also noticed that this, they, published, they submitted fewer papers than they did before. So that's also something else, right? Um, and in many cases, we found out it was done to personal circumstances. Um, if two people are working and uh, they both have to work at home, and if they have children, in many households, the childcare duties traditionally fall on women. And that means that you would have less time to write papers. Um, on the other hand, we found that some people that did not have uh, family responsibilities, for instance, were actually able to be more productive through the pandemic because they didn't have to go to office and to do experiments and to do meetings. They could just dive into their data and write, 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 and submit, submit, submit. So maybe the question is more, what could they do? I would say it's not something you can always do, but something to do is don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, build your network, build your support network. And that can be particularly difficult if you're you know, an expat like me, because I don't have any family here. Uh, for, fortunately, I have some friends. Um, but you need, if like, nobody's Wonder Woman, right? Uh, everybody can only achieve what they achieve because of the people that help them along the way, whether they're a man, whether they're a woman. And I think there is perhaps sometime this assumption that as a woman, you're meant to do it all. So you have to be a wonderful mother and a wonderful spouse and be successful at your job. And I don't know, if you want to have hobbies, you have to add that to the list as well. And I imagine if in research, you have to do your research and you have to write papers and you have to submit them. And all of this is time consuming and there's only 24 hours in a day. So basically I would say the one thing to do right is try to build a support network and don't hesitate to ask for help. And also, especially in pandemic, it's okay to say, I'm not okay. Um, this is hard. No, I can't deliver this next week. I will need more time. I think that people have been incredibly understanding of circumstances. And I know, for example, we've, we've done the same, you know, for uh, publishing operations. Like for example, in terms of asking um, reviews by a certain date, we've been able to extend review periods. If we've been asking for manuscript revisions, we've also been very considerate about the time it might take. For book authors, we've also been able to, you know, extend deadlines if needed. So, yeah, that would be my advice. Ask for help and uh, feel free to ask for extended deadlines, especially. Thank you, Sarah. You know, again, you know, all of these uh, sort of uh, people's paths through and how they overcame adversity and uh, how they've sort of managed to uh, push through um, potentially you know, barriers uh, that, you know, really are systemic, uh, I think are really useful. So I'd like to turn now for another question to Dr. Zhou. So given that APN is women dominated at the present time, does this also help with thinking about maybe, uh, is this a, an arena where we can provide data for benefits that might come with greater representation of women in other fields? For example, you know, are there some perspectives on whether mentorship might be better or worker productivity is higher because the gender balance is different? Does, does the APN provide a good situation to provide some data along these lines compared to with, with say, comparable training levels among doctors? Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I think so. But uh, maybe I, I, I would like you to rephrase the last portion of the question. Okay. Sorry for that. I think I, I think the question um, <clears throat> the question is about uh, you know there are quite a few reports um, you know I think McKinsey uh, like from the business side of things um, made a lot of the initial reports uh, several years ago that you know, when you have greater diversity when you have uh, better gender balance actually business performance and of course they were focused more on companies business performance actually goes up so it's actually economically better it's not just a you know, it, it's not just a cost to business to achieve gender equity and to achieve diversity. It's actually a benefit to the bottom line. And so, you know, I was wondering, um, 
especially for you know healthcare, where many of these fields are healthcare and academics, many of these fields are heavily male dominated. You know, um, are there some examples that we can draw where the gender balance has changed, and you know, some other performance metrics to say even aside from the 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 better goal of uh, better diversity, that there are other benefits to the field that may come from this as well. Does, does that make sense? Yes. So I agree with you. I think by looking at nursing profession, definitely we cannot really achieve to, to, to peer equality, the same number of women and same number of men. But I think it's the complementary of the different gender and to value each of the gender bringing their diversity of uh, 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 the ideas, the contribution that is going to be more valuable in the uh, modern healthcare. Because by looking at in the nursing field, I think we are no more just bedside nursing. We are also engaging for technologies to, to be uh, uh, involved in the healthcare. I think it's not really to really achieve uh, uh, equal, uh, uh, purely uh, just a gender equality. I think that is rather to achieve a, a better complement to different genders' contribution into the healthcare. So that is my uh, uh, my thoughts. But however, I, I believe my study will be really further explore on this part because. Uh, by listening Dr. Lin's session gave me a lot of ideas to further on how to explore on this particular area. I may not think, I think each gender have their own benefits to the health care. So, so this is really a thing we would like to further explore. But I believe to have more meals in the nursing profession will make slightly change. For, for, for the way we present nursing profession, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, for Professor Maitland, um, a question. You mentioned critical thinking earlier on. Would you have any uh, personal experiences or insights as to how we could incorporate more of that critical thinking into um, our training of doctors in the medical school, for example? That's a very difficult one. <laughs> it's the million dollar question. Um, I think um, when you, I mean, quite easily, you could do this by taking a publication. Um, and uh, I mean, just on a simple thing, um, in, especially one that's people quote quite a lot in, in a particular area and um, where actually the, the, the field is split on, you know, on the, uh, the, the quality of what, what is presented and actually take people through, you know, their experimental methods um, and their interpretation, because there, you know, there's a whole range of things that people can, um, for example, uh, if you've not got 100% of information, you can. there are particular uh, statistical methods where you can impute data. Now, if people if, uh, impute data based on what's already there, but then treat it as real data uh, and, and, and focus on that, then that, that's, you know, you can then say, well, I'm, I'm not quite sure, you know, that your conclusions from this paper are correct. Um, and I think if if you have more examples where people can can do that sort of thing. So in um, for example, in my area, there was a study that came out. Uh, um, it was uh, it was um, in the emergency room. Um, uh, it was a paper by Rivers um, about giving very aggressive therapy um, and using a particular um, central venous pressure line uh, line um, for monitoring. Um, and the, the, that actually changed quite a lot of guidelines overnight on a single centre. But, you know, and, and people still quote that paper, but there was quite a lot of um, flaws, a single centre, you know, all of those type of things. And I think um, certainly uh, learning how to evaluate uh, uh, 
uh, when it certainly comes down to um, clinical practice, being able to have those um, uh, skills in saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I've, I've read the headlines on this paper. Can I di dive a bit deeper into this? What are the strengths? What are the weaknesses, etc.? I mean, it took an, a massive multi-center study to overturn the results of that um, and, and also change, change back the guidelines. So, you know, it, implications are enormous from these type of uh, you know, uh, studies where they're, they're, they're built up. And, uh, you know, uh, and it, it does. Yeah, and I think uh, uh, so th those are the types it's a, that's particularly in my area. And people today are still quoting that as if there hasn't been subsequent research that has actually shown that that wasn't the case. So, uh, yes, I think that has to be brought in at a, into medical education fairly early on. I can only do that by example, I'm afraid. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Maitland. It, it, that certainly is a very tough question. And I think something that a lot of us as uh, those of us that are educators are also struggling with all the time, uh, you know, uh, especially, you know, sort of tying together a lot of these themes that we've had today already about international mobility. And then that leads to interaction with different education systems that then may, uh, you know, have different perspectives, uh, like you mentioned about critical thinking versus uh, what the, the kind of society expectations um, uh, for what that education is supposed to be. And I think that also then ties in, you know, of course, you know, you sort of mentioned this, but, you know, really happy to have uh, Sarah Hage here because the publications in terms of access and in terms of making sure that the world has access to the benefits of research uh, is important. So I want to use that to kind of return to uh, a question for Sarah. So you had, there were a couple of questions in the Q&A box uh, directed to you um, about this issue. Um, and that is uh, that, uh, I, I'll just sort of take one, they're kind of talking about the same topic, to remove the gender bias in the review of manuscripts for publication. So has Elsevier, for example, uh, considered withholding authors' names and in research institutions until after the review process? Or how much attention is paid to uh, the gender uh, makeup of the reviewers that are selected? That's a really, really good question. So. First of all, allow me to um, go back a little bit on how our journals are managed, right? So typically within Elsevier, we have a publisher, publishing team and other corporate professionals that will be supporting the journal. The leadership of the journal is typically um, handled by external editor in chief uh, and editorial boards, right? And they would be the one that would take most of these kind of decisions for the journals. So um, what I know is that we have 2,500 journals at the moment, uh, give or take, and therefore we have 2,500 give or take editors in chiefs and editorial boards. And each of these have different views as to how they want to run the journal, right? So we can influence them and we can support their choices. But typically I would say the decision of whether the peer, review, the peer review system is blind, double blind, or fully open is not up to us. Um, we, we lead that to the, to the editors. And I know that we have different peer review models across all of our different journals, depending on what the preferences of the editors are. Uh, meaning that some of our journals have double blind peer review where you wouldn't know who the author is and you wouldn't know who the reviewer is, right? Uh, then there is also single peer review where only the identity of the reviewer is hidden, but the identity of the, um, the author is known. And then uh, I believe we're also experiencing with open review where everybody can see everybody's name, including after publication uh, in the publication record as well, who reviewed and what the comments were and such. And we are learning a lot from all of these different ways of doing things because each of them has positives um, and negatives, right? Um, when I was working in research evaluation, I reviewed a few papers and sometimes it's actually helpful to know who the author is um, because if you've been following the work of certain authors, then you might know that their work might be trustworthy. There's like, they come with this brand, right? If they're a well-known experienced author in your field, you've read several papers, it's kind of, a easy way to guide um, the review. Um, I know that through most of the submission systems, 
you wouldn't actually necessarily know who the author is because a lot of authors would just have their family name and their initial. So you couldn't infer what their gender would be from their name, right? So that even though if you had a name and an institution, I mean, you could do some Googling, I suppose, but from the paper itself, you wouldn't know this is a paper by men or by women. And as far as I know, in our systems, it is not compulsory to indicate your full first name. So you, even if your paper is going to be um, not following blind review or double blind peer review, you could still not have to reveal your gender very, um, very proactively. So sorry, that was a little bit of a long answer. Uh, and I don't think there is, there is a, a good question. So we also see some differences by different fields. Uh, and as, I think as far as Ernst is concerned, we're quite happy to follow what the editors um, want to do for each of their journals because each of them may have um, advantages and disadvantages alike. Thank you very much, Sarah Huggett. Um, that was very um, interesting to find out the background to how you make decisions and uh, what or can or what will be done in the future. This morning has gone by very quickly. Um, thank you all for all your questions. Uh, we may not have been able to answer all of them. However, we have time for one more and it's a general question for all the members on the panel. The question is, could the panel share some models on how to assist women who have been away from their careers due to family concerns? How can we help them transit back into the professional workforce? Perhaps um, you'd like to start, Dr. Ling, uh, and I hope I'm not putting you on the spot here. <laughs> yeah, so I'll, I'll have to speak as a husband. So I, I'll just briefly describe um, what, what happened with my family when we had our first two children. So for the, the first child, um, my wife took no pay leave from her job and then she went back as like a contract uh, worker. Um, I mean, the, the employment contract details, I'm a bit hazy, but essentially it was in a, a position that was, uh, that allowed her to, to continue uh, caring for my young son at the time, that something that she was comfortable with that gave her the hours. Um, then that, that uh, transited back into uh, full-time work. And, and then our second child was also a surprise. So again, she took uh, some, some no pay leave there again. And then she basically uh, repeated the same thing where she, she tried out a bit of contract work first before transiting back uh, full-time. And, and again, um, my experience of it was that it was uh, dictated by her, her preferences about like how much time she wanted to spend with the children. Um, definitely, there were a lot of doubts about whether, you know, was she still competitive? Um, was it worth the time, the time spent away? Was the salary adequate and so on and so forth? But yeah, so that's, that's just my experience of it. And and I think when it comes to transiting back to the workforce, we we have to recognize that that everyone's a unique individual and that their family situations are unique as well. So just because you are looking after a kid of the same age, it doesn't mean that the experience is the same. Some kids are incredibly wonderful and angelic, and some kids are like tearing up the house. Then, you know, as... Um, I think especially in a Singaporean context, you may have to look after your parents as well. So that's another dimension of caregiving that is not always uh, recognized. So I think the, the main take home for me when I observed her was that, that um, other people's experiences are references, but ultimately you get to decide and when in doubt, choose the one that's the least onerous first and try it out before, before committing to it. And of course, again, this assumes that there's an employer that is willing to uh, let, to have these flexible work arrangements in place. Yeah, so that's what I have on this. 
Thank you very much for, for your perspective, Dr. Ling. Maybe we can turn this question to uh, Dr. Zhou now and get your perspective. Again, the, the question is uh, sharing on some models for how to assist women who have been away from their careers uh, due to family or care concerns, transit back to the professional workforce. Dr. Zhou. Thanks. I think this phenomenon is very common in nursing because nursing is a female dominant at this stage uh, profession. A lot of people, once they have bear a child, they will try, they will leave the profession for a short period of time. So in order to actually assist them to retransfer back to the workforce, there are two factors, two major factors. One is the internal individual factors. The other factor is external, the environment factors. I think internally, they must get ready. Things what they have done many years ago will be different from what they are going to encounter uh, when the time they transit back to, to to the career. So they need to internally prepare and actually to face the obstacles positively. I think the internal drive, perseverance is very important. However, externally, I think we need to build a welcome culture. We need to really put uh, 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 the mindset people still can be, uh, uh, can be competent uh, can be actually on par with the current workforce. So that's why beside the welcome culture, I think we need to inbuilt the training, uh, 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 the training programs to actually make sure uh, people come back to the profession being received the latest up-to-date training to make sure they actually competent and confidence to restep back to, 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 to the profession. Uh, but of course, on another side, I think uh, 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 individual must open up if they feel difficulties and they feel challenges in the new uh, culture of working, they need to voice out as well. So uh, like what just now Dr. Lin have mentioned, maybe all these people really come back to workforce, we need to have a good mental structure to support them not only for the professional competency as well as the personal needs. Yeah, I think that is what I taught. Thank you very much, Dr. Zhou, for your insight, especially for the nursing profession. Um, could we hear perhaps from you, Mrs. Sarah Huggett, about your experience and um, some recommendations perhaps? Um, I can certainly share what has helped me. And I'll go back to what I said before about support and help. Um, so if I look back on uh, my four pregnancies, giving birth and going back to work, the main help for me was my husband. Um, my husband is a homemaker. And through that, it meant that after each of my pregnancy, I was quite comfortable going back to work quite soon because I knew my children were going to be taken care of very well by my husband. Um, so he gave up his career to take care of our family, uh, which is incre well, increasingly common, but still quite fair. Um, and that was the main factor that allowed me to be able to not stay away from work too much in each of my maternity leave. The second one would be my company. I have been with Elsevier since 2006, and they're really uh, increasing the work flexibility practice and how we get back to work. And because I have this long reputation with my company, they know they can trust me. So they are willing to make efforts to adjust what will work for me because they are keen to retain me as an employee. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing is actually myself. I help myself a lot uh, in that, uh, especially with a uh, mobile phone now, it's quite easy to just keep aware. And I, lo I love my work. So I just want to know, I don't want to, and my, that was my personal choice, but I didn't want to just push work away completely and then come back. I had a bit of fear of missing out and I like to keep aware of latest developments. So I just kept myself aware of what was happening. I kept my network going. And that's what really helped me to, be able to, um, you know, go back to work without having too much of a gap uh, and just go straight back in. That's it. Thank you very much, Sarah. I think, you know, thanks for sharing uh, 
your situation and your experience, I think the, the normalizing of the different choices, I mean, certainly sometimes some uh, families will make the choice that one person will give up their career and to sort of normalize it, that should be an equitable decision, I think is an important thing and something that is uh, definitely um, happening more uh, and that's encouraging to see. So finally, can we um, turn to Professor Maitland and you know, sort of acutely aware that you showed that, uh, you know, in some of your career progressions, actually the, the topic came up explicitly about being a wife or, or having babies and, you know, uh, unfortunately in these sort of, you know, unfair ways. Can we maybe get your take on this, Professor Maitland? Yeah, so um, I had my young family in the 90s and things were very different there. Um, employment meant you, you, if you took a job, it was full time. So having flexibility around, uh, you know, being able to negotiate with your employer, a university or a, at the time an NHS, um, can I come back part time was not there. But I think that the, that the world has changed since then. And I think you've got to um, it, be very gentle on yourself when you come back because you're not the same as everybody else you've still got ongoing care commitments to be able to do that and also say i'm 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 working 100 percent of the time um and that, that for me was very very tough um we also lived during a time when you were as registrars you um would go in um for your your your, your shift it would start out after your commute um, at, at um, eight or nine o'clock in the morning. Um, you'd do your on-call overnight and you'd still be there at five o'clock the next day. So you might not have slept. Um, and then you go back home. Um, and that was that was really, really hard, especially when you had a husband that was also working um, uh, through his career. So I think um, my advice is obviously if you're coming back from um, obviously uh, uh, ch ch childcare and you've still got ongoing um, uh, childcare responsibilities or other care responsibilities, do be gentle with yourself. Um, you, you're, you know, you, you, you only have one one time in your life when that, that your your family are going to be around. Your career can sort of take a little pause. Come back slowly. Come back um, on a part time, and also choose your mentors well. That they under, you know have a a good um, understanding of 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 the ch the challenges. Um, and and just as yes, I say, don't push yourself too hard. Um, I think yes, my experience is probably wouldn't be replicated nowadays because I think things have changed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Maitland, for sharing with us. And I believe that having, you know, your spouse and yourself both being registrars on call, having a young family, it adds to the difficulties, but also you look back thinking, wow, we managed all that. Um, thank you for sharing. When we started the webinar this morning, I think um, Swain and myself probably were suffering from imposter syndrome. <laughs> None of us are actually anchor people for the nine o'clock news, but uh, three hours into the event, we've done you know, fairly well and that syndrome has sort of left us. All we would like to do now is uh, thank you on all our audience, our panelists on behalf of the NUHS Women in Science and Healthcare and the NUS Equal Opportunities and Career Development Office. We just want to thank you for spending this morning with us. Swain and I had a great time listening to the talks and discussions, and I'm sure everyone did. We'd like to extend our gratitude to all our special guests and speakers. Our guest of honor, Madam Rahayu Mazam, Professor Yo Kei Guan, Professor Chong Yap Singh, Professor Catherine Maitland, Mrs. Sarah Huggett, Professor Sophia Archuleta and Professor Gan Yun Huen and the EOCD grants uh, recipients, Dr. Zhou Wen Tao, Dr. Ling Zheng Dai, and the logistics and technical prowess required to put this webinar together was no mean feat. We'd like to express our deep appreciation to the NUS EduTech team that saved us on many occasions while we were preparing for this event. Corpcoms, and the MedEx team for supporting this entire webinar. A big, big thank you. Um, really a round of applause to Ms. Rachel Chan from the EUCD office for producing today's webinar. Um, kudos to you. 
I think it was the first time and it was a brilliant run that you did. Thank you all for joining us. We hope you learned something and also drew some inspiration to choose to challenge, not just for International Women's Day, but every day throughout the year. And please remember to look out for the recording, which will also be posted on YouTube. And feel free to share this with your friends and networks. NUHS WISH will also be continuing our Lunch and Learn series. So look out for more information on that soon. Melina and I are delighted to have had your company in celebration today of International Women, International Women's Day. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.